I, uh, for the next hour, we're joined by the makers of a noble lie, uh, Chris Emery and James Lane. Chris Emery, of course, uh, was one of the producers, and James Lane's the director. And, of course, I'm in it. A lot of other, uh, Jane uh, Graham, who was a witness to what happened uh, working in HUD, is in it. Uh, Terrence Yankee's mother, the police officer who found out the truth that they killed and tortured, uh, is in it. Uh, it. Look, they're with us. I'm going to have them break it down. This is a short segment, long segment coming up. The reason it's important is there's no film made that's just about it, just about Oklahoma City in the last decade or so. And there's no film uh, that's been modernly produced with all the latest info. And the gentleman that we have on have been researching this for many, many years. I mean, I know that Chris Emery, I've been seeing him investigate this for at least, it's got to be close to a decade. So I think in this short segment, why is this important to you? You guys live in Oklahoma. How did you get started on it? And I think it's important to then break down what we really know about Oklahoma and then see if you agree with me. It's important to get this out now because people need to understand when they stage another one, they're going to use it against the, 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 the good people in America. And exposing this may stop them from staging a new Oklahoma City. Um, go ahead, gentlemen. Uh, absolutely, Alex. And that's one thing that we saw with the underwear bomber. Kurt Haskell, in his first radio interview, said that he knew that there was something wrong with this official story of 9-11, and he was determined not to allow a cover-up to happen with the underwear bomber. So I think that that shows that we are having an effect, you know, uh, the entire you know activist community in getting the message out and maybe stopping these events from happening. And that's what's important about this documentary, A Noble Lie. We show the methodology that they use to cover up these events and uh, use them to steer, you know, the geopolitical uh, ends. Uh, what you're going to get from this documentary is uh, information, whether you know uh, everything about the Oklahoma City bombing or nothing, you're going to walk away with something new because we cover the information that was garnered in the early years of the investigation from the Oklahoma Bombing <laughs> Investigation Committee, and then we get further into it with the new information that's come out from Jesse Trinidou and his FOIA requests. Continue. Uh, Go ahead. Uh, one uh, good perspective we get on this, Alex, is that um, here's a whole new generation that has literally grown up since the event happened. And they are the ones that the, the seeds are being planted on uh, by the corrupt people such as Mr. Shapiro, our current administration, Eric Holder. These people wake up in the morning and have no compunction with lying about this case. It's just absolutely shocking and disgusting. What we want to do is present the, the generation that was living at the time and the new generation with the correct information so they can make sound decisions and realize, you know what, we're still being lied to about this case. And that's why the truth's still important, you know, almost 17 years after the fact. These people are still in positions of power today. They still have the ability to perpetrate another event like this. And this is what we're trying to hope uh, for here with the movie is to get some justice, you know, the deserved administering of punishment to the people that were involved. Uh, that's why we chose the title A Noble Lie. That's uh, uh, from Plato's The Republic. It's a lie told by the elite to maintain social harmony or the position of the elite. And that's what we see happen here is that uh, you know, this, uh, wh whether or not you think, uh, whatever level you think that the federal government had it involved here, it is very obvious that there was a cover-up and they used this for their own political purposes. You know, There was a great movement at that time uh, against uh, globalization. Uh, the, all of the agenda was completely Completely stalled. You had, uh, you know, patriots uh, all over the country that were trying to restore the Constitution. Uh, there was legislation that was trying to be passed, the anti-terrorism legislation. You cover that in the film, and uh, all that was stalled after the Oklahoma City bombing. If you mentioned anything about, you know, restoring the Constitution or the uh, uh, fighting the expansion of the police state powers, uh, now you're a McVeigh. It was used to silence everybody, and we see that as a precursor to 9/11 and the Patriot Act. This is a methodology that they use over and over again, and Oklahoma. City, I think, is one of the best cases that we can use to expose their methodology because there's so many holes in the case. It's so easy to tear it apart. What we tried to do with this is boil it down to just the most provable essence. All right, you know, stay there. Stay there. We're going to come back with the most provable essence. That was James Lane speaking, Chris Emery, the producer with him. By the way, they got a great uh, video connection with us there in their studio of your prison planet. Not TV viewer, but for the radio listeners, we'll also post this, uh, obviously, by this evening on the public YouTube channel. Uh, but it's so important to expose a noble lie, a globalist gambit against liberty to stop the patriot counter coup against their takeover. A noble lie, Oklahoma City, 1995. Without truth, there is no justice. V.Z. Lawton, Oklahoma City bombing survivor. And the film 
is just jam packed with survivors and eyewitnesses. It is, it really is the antidote to the lie. And if you order it uh, by Sunday, we can guarantee that it'll be shipped out to you before Christmas so you can give it as a gift or buy a couple copies, one for yourself and, and uh, one to give friends and family. It is so important to support alternative media and filmmaking. Uh, with all of this internet censorship coming in and the open announcements that they want to start shutting off the alternative media because we're becoming the dominant media, it is more important than ever that we go with the old-fashioned DVD and VHS and things like that to continue to get this information out to people. Because as the system starts to try to clamp down on free speech, people are going to recognize it m more. Uh, and, and, and the system's doing this because they're being exposed. The system is going in this direction because they're going to get in a lot of trouble if they don't. I mean, Corzine has been caught stealing billions of dollars. He's one of the top White House advisors, former governor in New Jersey, former head of Goldman Sachs. And the rats are leaving the sinking ship. His own people at the CME group are saying, no, he knew about it and gave the order. I'm not going to lie for him. And the media is trying to act like that news didn't come out three days ago. This is huge. Just like Fast and Furious. First, he said he didn't know about it. Then it turned out he was intimately involved in it. Now the media says, oh, he put a stop to it, though. The government shipping guns into Mexico to destabilize Mexico, but to also then blame the Second Amendment. And CBS News got those memos. A pure example of a false flag staged event. Now, I want to get into the film. I want to get into the crystallized key points that prove the official story is a fraud and there was a government cover-up and government involvement, elements of government. But I also want to parallel it to today with uh, the Attorney General, who was the Deputy Attorney General, and we have his emails, thanks to lawsuits and, 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 and FOIA requests, where he was saying, we got to cover this up. It's a D-Day operation. Uh, we've got to get in there and, and make sure the public doesn't find out what happened. And they did. I mean, you know, people like Terrence Yakey went bye-bye. Uh, so again, joining us uh, from Oklahoma are Chris Emery and James Lane, um, the uh, director uh, of course, James Lane and the producer, Chris Emery, who, who've really made a first-class, only modern film. There were some underground things that came out right after it happened that did a great job exposing, you know, the bombs in the building and the newscast. But it was always grainy, you know, 10th generation. They got the original footage. They got stuff I've never seen before. I mean, uh, folks, it's not hype when I tell you a noble lie is a film you want to get. You want to have viewing parties. You want to give it to police, military, now. So that when the globalists stage this stuff to blame returning veterans and others, because that's what they've built their force up for, people know what they're dealing with. And just like you were mentioning, James, uh, the fact that with the, uh, because the gentleman on the plane, Kurt Haskell, saw the underwear bomber being got on the plane and things, he made mental note and his information turned out to be true and the government had to admit they got the underwear bomber on the plane. And so now our people, people who are awake to false flag, we're everywhere. And that's really shaking the system up. Please continue. Yes, and that's uh, that's why it's important for you know your viewers and listeners to you know go to the Infowars Org, pick up this documentary because it's going to show uh, again the methodology that's been used to you know cover up these events and, and, and again steer uh, steer us towards globalization. Uh, one thing that came out recently, you uh, you had Andrew Griffin on from Reddit Report. Uh, he was ex uh, exposing that uh, there's some internal documents that came out from uh, Fusion Center uh, that lists the OKBombing.net website as a domestic terrorist website. Now this was originally ran by the Oklahoma Bombing Investigation Committee uh, and the state representative Charles Key. Now when we see the NDAA bill being passed, you know, we wonder, okay, well who are the American citizens that they're going to want to round up and, and uh, detain indefinitely? Well, it's people that have the audacity to expose their corruption because these institutions' primary goal above all else, above truth and justice, is self-preservation. You know, and I mean, this is a state representative that, that just it was trying to get to, you know, uncover the truth. And by the way, the federal document that we showed on air, if we can pull it up, state <clears throat> fusion document, Homeland Security document says, OKC investigators are terrorists. We can put the actual document up. That'll pull it up if you want to search it, uh, viewers or listeners or my own team. You notice they give a brief description and they say, this group uh, doesn't believe the official story. They're terrorists. And of course, it's just a derelict website. He put the report out almost a decade ago, run by state rep Charles Key, very upstanding with grand jurors and others that were there and knew what happened. General Parton, former head of Air Force Weapons Development. And so here they are telling cops, 
you investigate this and say it might not be what you were told, you're a terrorist. It's like people three weeks ago said, this can't be true. Uh, the government's going to secretly arrest citizens, and now it's admitted. But, but guys, break it down. You've got the floor. Well, I, uh, I think we should elaborate on the, the press, uh, Alex, and what you brought up. Melissa Cleansing was the news director for Channel 4, KFOR in Oklahoma City, the, uh, the morning of the bombing. And up to a year following the case, she said, and one of her famous quotes was, there's not one person in Oklahoma City that believes the, uh, that Timothy McVeigh blew up the E.P. Murrah building by himself. The New York Times swept in, bought out Channel 4. They did not renew the contract for the news director and one of the top, um, I think one of the top beat reporters, Jana Davis, that actually investigated this case. That is a clear sign that the media does control the, the stories in the way they want to. They will literally go out and buy out a station or a newspaper. So if your listeners are in any doubt that that's, is, that happens, it continues to happen. We've seen it firsthand right here in Oklahoma City. The, uh, the blast pattern of the building clearly shows that there was contact charges. There are sources that came forward that uh, we're going to elaborate on that uh, some were not included in the movie that heard the um, both the, the FBI and other law enforcement officers say, look, there were swabs. There were uh, actually samples that were taken off of the columns that sh clearly show that there was C4 that dismantled those columns. Yeah, we've got uh, Brigadier <clears throat> General Parton uh, interviewed in the documentary, and he did an ex excellent analysis uh, saying that there had to be additional ordnance inside the building. He actually showed where they would have to be placed. To and he came to and warned people at the time when he saw it in the news. He saw the blast points on columns further away from columns mm -hmm. that weren't damaged right up by the truck. You have the seismographs, the reports, the recordings, the ATF showing up seconds after, uh, police being suspicious about it. I mean, it just goes on and on. Exactly. And we've got witnesses, actual survivors from the building. I mean, who are you going to believe, the FEMA report or the actual survivors that were in the building? They said that the building was coming down 8 to 10 seconds before the truck bomb went off. I mean, to the point where the building was shaken and they thought it was an earthquake. And, and they had enough time to get under their desk, you know, before the glass Jane blew Graham in. heading up HUD. As you know, we've interviewed her. She's in your film. Jane Graham saw them the day before wiring the building, a bunch of feds, and thought it was telephone men. I mean, they were just all over the place doing it. Yeah, and if the FEMA report says that that blast wave was traveling at 1,300 feet per second, you explain to me how that glass blows in, you know, and they've got 8 to 10 seconds before that to actually get under their desk. It's just nonsense. We've got a quote from uh, Dr. Samuel Cohen, the inventor of the neutron bomb, saying that it, it doesn't matter how much ammonium nitrate and fuel oil was used, it would be against the laws of physics for it to create the blast pattern that it did. We've got an Eglin Air Force Base report. The Air Force reconstructed the event. They used the barrels, and they said that the gap between the the barrels actually canceled out most of the blast and pushed it upwards. They created one single larger bomb, set it off to a weaker next to a weaker structure, and it did less damage. It was the final analysis from that report that there had to be additional ordnance inside the building. And by the way, the ATF, when was it they blew up their own rider truck to their own test right before? It was in the months before in uh, the deserts of New Mexico. That's correct. Almost identical. I mean, these people are, and of course, Terrence Yankee, the police officer, knew that, but we know what happened to him. That was very unfortunate. A year and three weeks after the bombing, he was found brutally murdered um, about uh, a mile and a half from the front gate of the El Reno Penitentiary. That's 32 miles west of downtown Oklahoma City. He walked uh, nearly a mile from his vehicle and just uh, multiple uh, deep lacerations to the uh, arms and the neck, uh, rope burns on the neck, handcuff uh, scars on the wrists. And uh, they said that he shot himself next to a tree. Completely ludicrous. No investigation done in the Just case. like Vince Foster, of course, what his last call was to his partner, though, that he'd gone to his storage shed to get, you know, the proof and that feds were following him. That's correct. He, it was actually, the, the death blow was a wound that came down from the top of his head through the bottom of his jaw at a distance far enough away not to leave powder burns, you know. And then they, his death is called a suicide. They don't do an autopsy, you know. And, he, the, you know, his family said that he wasn't suicidal. He was getting promotions. He was getting the key to the city. He had reconciled with his wife. He had everything to live for. And when they questioned the, that it was called a suicide, they said, well, you guys are, are paranoid. You watch too much television. One thing that we found out from the county sheriffs in uh, Canadian County, which is next to Oklahoma County, where Oklahoma City is, that uh, these are people that Terrence went to kindergarten with, he went to high school with, they were uh, sheriffs, deputies. They showed up at the scene where Terry's body was found, and they said that there were law enforcement personnel, both plainclothes and uniformed, turning over the crime scene with spade shovels, completely in the face of any 
tangible or any credible investigation. They did not do an autopsy. They were literally mopping up the torture and murder scene. It was horrible. It was absolutely horrible what they did. This was used to silence anybody else that uh, was going to investigate this. You know, and by the way, see, those sheriffs right then should have just arrested those feds. I mean, clearly, you're covering this up. You were involved. But see, n not in America now. Oh, you're a fed. Uh, oh, let me grovel to you. But, but again, dovetailing this, look at Fast and Furious. Look at how it, they were shipping the guns into Mexico, drugs back in. It's even in the New York Times now, but nobody's in trouble. And ABC just came out with internal uh, emails saying that they were going to use this uh, event to uh, issue new gun control legislation. I mean, it's just out in the open now. Um, something else that was interesting about Terry Yakey is one of the hallmarks of an ammonium nitrate and fuel oil bomb is a nitric gas cloud. Anytime that it was used in Ireland uh, 41 years ago last August in Sterling Hall, uh, they set off an ampho bomb. The first 26 responders were hospitalized from inhalation of nitric gas. That did not occur at the Oklahoma City bombing. Uh, uh, Terry Yakey was on the scene within minutes and saved eight people's lives that day. All of the survivors said that they, they had no problem with respiration other than a little bit of the smoke from the cars that were out front. So there was no ammonium nitrate gas, which calls into question that AMFA was even used at all. No, they did that to then start tracking farmers and teach that, you know, the American people are terrorists. Now, again, why were they so scared of Terrence Yankee? I mean, you interview his mother in this film. I believe that's the first time she's been interviewed in the film. I mean, folks, I can't tell you, this is a true investigative masterwork, and it's cyanide to these vampires. This is a big old bucket of holy water, a big old silver cross to Cal Dracula, but you've got to get it, and you've got to use it against them. Uh, what, I've, I've, I'll just ask you on air, what, uh, what's your stance on folks airing this on Access TV? Oh, we encourage it. Uh, if anybody wants to uh, set up a local screening, they can get in contact with us at contact at freemindfilms.com. We'll send them movie posters that they can use to promote it. Other people are talking about putting it in the libraries. They can go to InfoWars store, buy it there, put it in the libraries, uh, you know, get the word out. We've had, uh, in fact, a member of the bombing committee, uh, very active in a local parish here in, in uh, Oklahoma City, wants to do a showing at his church. We encourage that. I'm looking forward to meeting the pastor. So the word. Well, Americans out. couldn't believe the government was this evil 15, 16 years ago. But doesn't Fast and Furious and Tonkin being declassified and all this stuff being out now and that us evil 9-11 truthers question things? We've broken the ice. So people now understand this. But why do you think all these White House advisors are so arrogant? It's like five of them now are pleading if we just had one it would really help you i mean how dumb do you think we are to be writing articles saying we'll blame our enemies we really need one and obviously the higher-ups are going no they're on to us we can't do it they're intoxicated with arrogance alex and after and you know all the intel on this most of it and what we've seen i you're right it's absolutely unbelievable that they can get up in the morning and look at themselves in the mirror and think that they can actually get away with this they have no value for human life and we saw it firsthand here. Yeah, when you look at the, uh, you know, all of the criteria of a psychopath, these people actually meet all of the criteria. They believe that we are actually lesser beings than they are, and they have no uh, remorse for, you know, riding our ashes uh, to, to their own political ends. Now, the head of the FBI's counterterrorism group claimed he was in Dallas and got a Southwest flight. Turned out he didn't fly. They have the hotel receipts. He's that arrogant. We know some of the teams that were already there. And so from your deep research, because you guys are nose to the grindstone on this, go through some more of the points, but, but, but also, as, as best we can tell, exactly who was involved in this. From my research, what it's, it's, it's FBI, high-level government special forces, some private think tanks, some foreign intelligence operatives, uh, and FBI. Well, we have a, uh, here in Oklahoma, in eastern Oklahoma, we have a white separatist compound called Elohim City. Now, this seemed to be a base of operations uh, for the Oklahoma City bombing. Uh, you had uh, FBI informant Carol Howe, I'm sorry, ATF informant Carol Howe, was telling the ATF prior to the Oklahoma City bombing that these people were scouting out locations to attack federal buildings. Now, there was foreknowledge there. We've got a witness, an uh, actual resident of Elohim City, that says that he can place Timothy McVeigh on site. Uh, so yeah, they were using it as a cutout, and the Southern Property Law Center had operatives in there, correct? Exactly, yes, and that's sir. some of the documents that Jesse Trinidou has uncovered, is that there were at least six uh, Southern Poverty Law Center operatives at Elohim City at the time. And, you know, he said anytime you've got five people talking about overthrowing the government, three of them are working for the government. And it looks like they're using the Southern Poverty Law Center as a, as a private wing of the FBI and ATF to be able to, to do operations that, uh, you know, they wouldn't normally be able to do because of, you know, any restrictions of the institutions. Yeah. So 
out of that uh, city, you've got Andreas Strassmeyer. Now, that's the uh, that's the gentleman that uh, Jane Graham saw in the basement with the, the gray putty and wire. Mm -hmm. He was working out of Elohim City at the same time that McVeigh was there. Um, so, you know, these are the these are the players that, that tie all of this together. Now, why were so many Iraqis brought in uh, that had been brought in after the first Gulf War by Bush Sr. And, and Clinton? Was that a cover story or a, a, an emergency plan B to blame it on uh, Arabs and Muslims uh, if the domestic terror route didn't go well? You know, that's a red herring, Alex. I wish we could put a better thumb on that. But uh, you're right, there were over 5,000 refugees that were located to the uh, the Midwest and the Oklahoma City uh, area in Oklahoma. A lot of uh, the folks that were suspect on this case, uh, we know that some of them still live here in the city. And um, it's, it's very, very disgusting to see that they weren't brought into custody. We know that some of them were complicit, but we, we just couldn't include that in the film because we didn't have enough definitive information. Uh, another thing that concerns me about that is former CIA director uh, Woosley is actually uh, now publicly stating, yes, uh, you know, he thinks that there was uh, al-Qaeda involvement and such. And it looks like they're trying to use this to uh, yeah. support the, the you know, Well, I've always said they were going to double back because those guys were trained by the CIA when Saddam was, quote, the U.S. ally. And so that's why they were brought back out. Most of them were double agents who were helping give intel on Saddam. So they were brought back out at the end of the last Gulf War. And so we know some of them were videotaped, were involved, and then were allowed to leave the country. So, again, this is a classic intel op where they've got layer after layer so that no one knows the full story but the uh, mastermind. I, I wonder what Mr. Holter can tell us. Yeah, exactly. That's why we need to hold these people accountable. They're still in positions of power today. You know, we see that McVeigh was actually uh, telling his family and everybody that he was actually working for the government to uh, fly drugs into the United States and assassinate security risks. Uh, even, uh, you know, Terry Nichols, after he had gone through his uh, federal and state trials, was saying that, you know, he was ready to spill the beans about the other people that were involved. And people will question, well, if McVeigh was involved with all these other people and he was about to be put to death, why does he not, you know, uh, you know, turn them out and tell them what happened? Well, I I think that uh, you know the the presence uh, of Dr. Jolly and West. Uh, he consulted with uh, McVeigh's defense team uh, after his arrest. He was the number two psychological warfare expert in the country, just under Dr. Ewan Cameron. He worked with Patty Hearst, Saran Saran, and Jack Ruby. Now, after that, uh, stay there. You can't make this up. He was the assigned doctor for him from the arrest up to the execution. Every time McVeigh was on TV, he was drugged out of his gourd. We'll be right back. Stay with us. Folks, I cannot express to you enough that exposing false flag terror is the key at this temporal level of existence to bringing down these people because everything they do is stage a crisis, offer a solution. They stage a global financial crisis, take over society as a solution. On record, they don't even deny that. They stage, uh, oh my gosh, carbon dioxide is deadly, the earth's going to die, we got to tax and control everything to save the earth. Oh my gosh, we've got to take all your rights and invade and attack all these countries because you're in danger and they're going to blow stuff up. It's the oldest trick in the book, problem, reaction, solution. And again, I'm not going to push this much more. I just hope that you give the gift of truth this Christmas, whether it's all 18 of my films on DVD or 70% off and 18 different gifts. You can do all your shopping at once. A Noble Lie, Oklahoma City 95. You get Citizen Rulebook with it and Infowars.com and in the Fed bumper stickers as well. That's available at Infowars.com. And I mean, it's a life and death situation to expose that, hey, criminal elements in the government engaged in this military gambit. That's what it's called. It's really a gambit. In fact, I'll guarantee you that's what they called it. To demonize domestic groups and move towards using the military against the population. That's when all the, that current plan went into high gear that I became aware of at Oklahoma City. That's what really pushed me to get on air. I saw that, saw the local newscast that folks were mailing down to Austin and getting on Access TV. I was seeing like a week after it was on the news of the bombs being taken out and the governor talking about it and press conferences with Hoppy Heidelberg uh, or uh, uh, General Benton K. Parton. And the, I was watching what, what Oklahomans were seeing. And I, because there were folks sending it down here in a network, I was seeing it on Access TV, and I said, oh, my gosh. I'd already read in history books about Hitler blowing up the Reichstag and stuff. I said, i gotta, I got to go get on air. Like I'm getting the same chills I got back then. And I, boom, because it's the heart of it. It's how they sell everything else.
We got to attack Iran. They're going to nuke us. Uh, we got to have checkpoints because you can't be trusted. And, and it's prior restraint. It's saying you're bad. You're a terrorist. You're evil. Our guest will be with us for another 20 minutes. But I'll tell you, they're so informed and they've got such a great audio and video set up. I want to invite them back up next week to do part two because and, and you know, to really have it prepared, they can send me clips they want to play. And we can kind of go through the film and do a full review. We'll also try to do it on the nightly news. But this is so important. Uh, going back to uh, both of these uh, gentlemen, we're about to go to break here. But we're going to come back in the next 20 minutes, and I'm going to turn the mic off and you know, literally go sit in the control room so you guys can get your points out. But when we come back, what is most important in smoking guns? Well, were you guys threatened? Uh, you know, what else is important for folks to know about the film? <clears throat> The, uh, the the way the grand jury was given the information, they were very restricted on what they could see. And Judge David Russell, oddly enough, was, who presided over the grand jury, was uh, selected. He was on the short list of uh, uh, judges to, who actually selected the defense counsel. He ended up selecting McVeigh's own counsel. So this thing was rigged from, from day one, even on the judicial side. Hoppe Heidelberg comes forward in the movie and pretty much tells it all out. He lays it out, how he was treated, the fact that he wasn't able to get shop drawings, he wasn't able to call the witnesses, he wasn't able to call the arch architects, get any samples of the, the crime scene evidence, and he was given three choices on, on the, uh, uh, the situation. The judge pretty much could have dismissed him without cause, he could have granted uh, Hoppy's wishes on this letter that he wrote to the judge, or he could have said no, and then given reasons why he declined to give Hoppy the information. The judge took the first option of dismissing him from the grand jury without cause. Unbelievable. This is the only guy on the 12-member jury that was asking questions that were relevant to the crime. And mm -hmm. the FBI came to his house with their firearms threatening him. Exactly. exactly. He was the only one that would actually read the, the juror's handbook, and he knew what his rights were as a federal grand juror and demanded those. They, they weren't going to allow that. And they had Stay to there. Them. Back in one minute. We're doing part one of this interview live right now with our guest, the producer and the director of the film, A Noble Lie, available at Infowars.com. We were just talking about Hoppy Heidelberg with his Citizen's Rulebook. He actually had one of these. Same ones we sell, the Patriot one about jury nullification, all of it, the rights of a grand juror. And they got pretty upset about that. I think I, I talked to him years ago. From memory, I think he tried to hand these out, too, and that really made him upset. And they just wanted the cover-up to go ahead. Uh, but uh, he's in the film. Uh, continue, gentlemen. This is a five-minute segment. we got a 12-minute segment coming up before you leave us. But continue breaking down a noble lie in the Hoppy Heidelberg point. Well, you were talking about intimidation, and yes, Hoppy was uh, intimidated by the FBI. Or that well, they tr attempted to uh, intimidate him. He was uh, wasn't going to have any of that. But we also interview uh, Don Browning. He's a retired Oklahoma City police officer that worked at the Canine Unit and was there for search and rescue. He said that an FBI agent said that people that like him that ask questions often end up dead. And he said that it was the way it was presented to him. He thought it was a threat, you know. And oh, Martin, of course, yeah. I mean, uh, wow. I mean, they had their hitmen everywhere. Go ahead. Yeah. And a lot of the people that we interview in the movie, they've, they've stated that this is going to be the last interview they do. So, I mean, this is really the last chance that we, you know, to really encapsulate this story in, into, into one cohesive package. Uh, you know, we've got uh, folks like, uh, you know, Jane Graham, where she said, you know, this is it. She's not going to do another one. Exactly. One other thing that people will appreciate this film even more is that the gentleman that actually shot, he was our director of photography, shot the interviews had done the same thing on several uh, anniversaries the last four or five years for Discovery Channel, for History Channel, for National Geographic. He knew firsthand what they, as they say, left on the cutting room floor. And when we approached him, he says, I'm going to do it right for you guys. He says, nothing is going to go on the cutting room floor if I can help it. And by gosh, if our editor kept at least 95% of the interviews on there. So people are going to see what Discovery, what National Geographic, and what History Channel refused to put on the networks, we are going to show it. Yeah, that was our director of photography, Devin Winter, and he said that, uh, you know, they those uh, interview subjects said the same thing to, to them that they said to us, but this is the first time that it's all going to come out, because anything that con contradicted the official story, uh, you know, with these mainstream media outlets obviously got cut. Yeah, I've talked to Jane Graham, and in fact, since a lot of people are riding off of the sunset, now you gave me, well, I already have a lot of their numbers, but we do need to get you guys back on. I forgot that point next week and start having some of them on here and playing some clips just so the public realizes what we're talking about here. I mean, actually hear it from them. They've told all this to the mainstream media, and it never ends up getting out there because this isn't mainstream media. This is lying snake media that has brought our country to this point. 
I see uh, some of the hosts that you know, we look back on the archive footage, and we know who the hosts are. They, of course, they've aged quite a bit since then. I see them at basketball games. I'll see them at a Walmart or a 7-Eleven. They know who I am. They know who James is. We know who they are, and they just avoid us like the plague. They do not even want to talk about this. I mean, they were the, told to shut up. Yeah, in the early hours of the bombing, you know, all of the local news stations were telling the truth. And then after, uh, the, you know, federal uh, boots hit the ground, uh, the story started to change. The only station that really maintained any integrity for, for what, a few months was uh, the local station, Channel 4. Uh, but then the New York Times came in and bought them up and fired everybody that was uh, contradicting the official story and basically silenced uh, any dissent. Because this was about the re-election of Bill Clinton and the rollout of the military and police against the citizens. And now here we are, 15, 16 years later, and they've, they've overthrown Posse Comitatus. They're saying, we'll arrest you and throw away the key. Total tyranny. Drones are now being used. TSA checkpoints on highways. Government grabbing small children's genitals. I mean, who could ever believe it? But they, they did it all on the back of stage terror. Yeah, I mean, the, look at the anti-terrorism legislation that was stalled before the Oklahoma City bombing. It was it, it sailed through without any dissent after that. And, you know, same thing with the Patriot Act. You know, any expansion of police state power seemed to follow one of these false flag events. Wow. Well, before the year 2011 ends, we're going to have you guys back up repeatedly and uh, have uh, Jane Graham and others back on and some of the others you interviewed right there in studio with you so people can really have this on record. And, and, folks, we haven't even scratched the surface. When we come back, I want you guys to roll through the evidence of the film. Uh, and, 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 and as best you can research, who was behind the attacks specifically in the federal government? Stay with us. It's a noble lie. It is the only film in the last decade that's been professionally produced looking at Oklahoma City. I've got 35 minutes or so. My three-hour road to tyranny covers it, covers it well, but, but, but... Not with all the eyewitnesses and all the clear footage and um, the deep research they've done living in Oklahoma for many years. In fact, Chris, I'm just going from memory, but haven't you been around for like 10 years investigating this that I've heard of you out there being yes. involved? Yes, Alex. Thank you. Uh, it, it, I started 2000, actually moved here in 2003. To uh, There was no way that I could commute back and forth from Fort Worth and then uh, living in New Mexico for a year logistically was impossible. So I uh, decided to move here and um, it was amazing. Uh, just I was humbled by having the ability to talk to over 325 victims, family members, survivors, law enforcement, everybody that you found out one at a time that they knew there was something horribly wrong with the story. And some of them asked me to keep their names confidential. Others said, that's fine. You can put my name on there. They signed release forms. So well, you're break right, down some off. of the people that gave you intel that didn't want to be on the record. And then some of the other big bombshells that are on record. Uh, I mean, here you've got the inventor of the neutron bomb saying it's impossible. The former head of Air Force weapons development, the head grand juror mm -hmm. saying he was threatened. You know, the mother of the cop they killed who saw what the ATF did. Uh, the, you know, the woman, the head of HUD seeing the feds planting bombs and thinking they were telephone men. I mean, this is this is hardcore. And, 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 and this is a testament. You think you're safe, folks, with people like this running the country? It's a gambit in chess. And militaries do this, where you send in a hundred troops, a thousand, to bring out the enemy. You know it's going to wipe out the troops, but they're a sacrifice. And the argument is the end justifies the means. You don't lose 10,000 troops because you're willing to lose a hundred. That's what they do when governments conduct false flags, and it's very sick. Please continue. Break it down. Two people in, in particular, in fact, they're in the film. Um, after about three months, four months of research in this case, I had to get grounded. I had to get with somebody in, in law enforcement or former law enforcement that really knew the nuts and bolts of this case. And that's when I first met Craig Roberts in Tulsa. Drove up there, met with him for the better part of a day, and he laid it all out for me. And from, uh, and of course, he did an absolutely stellar job of getting the, the original cache of, of information uh, together on Terry Aiki. He handed me his dossier, a copy of it, and says, you want to run with this, go right ahead. And Craig is really, he's one of the, the, the underpinnings. He's, he's an excellent source of information on this. Why? Because he was actually asked by the FBI office in Tulsa to come on and investigate for them. They knew that he had the goods and the resources and the, basically the inside scoop on, on people that may or may not have known who actually committed this crime. And then the second person, of course, was Hoppe Heidelberg. So you go from former law enforcement to a gentleman that was actually on the, the grand jury. And after that, I says, my gosh, you know, we've got to get a clear focus on this. 
and um, and then people like James came forward and he was able to put the the uh, gel to this whole thing together. Well, what we try to do with this movie is uh, to to actually just boil it down to the most provable essence. And you know, like it, it, no matter if you know everything about the bombing or or nothing about the bombing, you're going to walk away with new information. We didn't want to just preach to the choir. We actually wanted to give activists and you know uh, people that are awake a tool that they can use to wake others up. And so we actually go through the official story at the beginning of the movie and then deconstruct how it is a lie. And I think you know in the beginning we're covering the Oklahoma Bombing Investigation Committee's information. Their research that has uh, stood, uh, you know, uh, without any, uh, you know, dissent uh, yet. In fact, that came out a few weeks before 9/11. It was meant to get a congressional hearing on the case, and then 9/11 completely overshadowed it. Uh, then we get into the information uh, more recently that, that researchers like Wendy Painting has been doing, actually going through the uh, defense archives, and then Jesse Trinidu, of course. I mean, you've had him on the show before, uh, Alex, and, and that guy is just uh, amazing. He's from the hills of Kentucky, and uh, his brother was brutally murdered at the federal transfer facility and he said you know you kill one of my family members you better kill all of us because we're not going to stop until we get some justice yeah, he's a lawyer who's keeps suing him and then they'll black out one document and he sues him again they black out the other part and he gets the full image and it's the government running the attack it's just incredible Exactly. I mean, he's kind of, he's the one that's uncovered the documents about the SPLC being involved. He, there's a, there was a CIA satellite actually pointed at that white separatist compound right. the day of the bombing. It took days to coordinate satellite movements back in those days. It's not what about like, Camp you know, Grouper uh, and the and the cops that were flying around privately and, and saw the truck being loaded with fuel oil. What's that? Well, uh, we never could get a definitive source on that. Uh, we think it's mere coincidence. In fact, the government uh, does rent out Ryder trucks on the, uh, quite often. They had a contract with the Ryder at the time, so it may have been just a coincidental overlap. But we really what about the video enough. that uh, Larry Flint and Hustler went with? It was sent to us, and then later sent to Hustler, where it looks just like McVeigh a year after he's supposedly in the, out of the military at that demolitions base. Again, we weren't able to include some of the information in the movie, but I did speak with Bill Bean yesterday, and we are going to put out a YouTube video. We have an extensive interview with him. We have his original footage, and we're going to be getting that out within the next week. Uh, so, yeah, you know, keep an eye out for that. Well, what's your view on that? I mean, clearly... Terry Nichols and others have signed affidavits now. This is what the other witnesses said. McVeigh, who was highly decorated, was taken, sheep dipped, put into security, and told he was basically, like you said, assassinating people, helping run drugs in the country for national security, of course, uh, and getting ready to set up domestic groups. Then, of course, they set him up. Yeah, exactly. And, you know, when you look at the death certificate after McVeigh was supposedly executed, uh, it says his occupation is U.S. Army. You know, I mean, it just gets ridiculous. You can, anybody can go look that one up. Uh, but, but I'll tell you what's crazy is I have a, I mean, it must be like every 10 people or something. I, I go to family reunions and stuff and have family and people who are most of them are like former Army officers. And off record, they were all recruited by the CIA, but then got out for different reasons. And it was usually, I won't deal drugs and kill people in America. So it, it's the Army is, from my research, is where they get most of the ground level drug dealing murderers i mean it's incredible they must have a giant army of them one thing that a lot of people don't realize mcveigh was actually on the security detail for general schwarzkopf in the fir per first persian gulf war he was a sharpshooter he got an award for his service actually when he was in custody at the denver county jail waiting federal trial so mcveigh was not a pushover in the army he was pretty sharp now, you were talking about the multiple trucks. Now, uh, James Sargent actually retired from an extensive military career uh, and then went fishing at uh, at the lake there in Kansas, uh, at Gary State Lake, where uh, McVeigh supposedly was setting the, uh, the uh, rider truck with the ammonium nitrate and fuel oil. He saw it days before. They saw the rider truck there days before the, the, the official story says the truck was there. At the same time, they're seeing trucks at, you know, a, a strip club in Tulsa, mm -hmm. uh, Lady Godiva's, you know, and they see the people there with Andreas Strassmeyer and McVeigh, you know, with the Ryder truck outside. So it looks like there were multiple trucks in play here. And Strassmeyer is an interesting character. I mean, like I say, he's really one of the, the threads that tie this all together. Uh, you know, after the bombing, he's whisked out of the country through Mexico, and the FBI says, well, they, they investigated it. Well, that consisted of them actually making a phone call and saying, were you involved? He said, no, okay, done. Well, the FBI has mountains and mountains of 302s from their investigation. They never asked any important people, the important questions. Yeah, no, it was all about creating a fake investigation as uh, Colonel Craig Roberts. He's also uh, Army um, a Lieutenant Colonel, and of course before that Marine in Vietnam, sniper himself, best-selling author, and of course one of the main sources for your film, but 
expanding on that. We have the all the different video cameras, and we have FBI agents in the L.A. Times and Washington Times uh, saying, I saw McVeigh with these other men getting in and out, and that they've declared national security on the tapes. Yeah, exactly. Every single person, every witness that saw McVeigh the day of the bombing, including the ones used for the prosecution, saw McVeigh with other perpetrators that day. Uh, why can't we see the videotapes? I mean, we saw this uh, the same thing with 9-11. They won't show us any of the videotapes of the of the Pentagon. Well, they won't show us any tapes of the Oklahoma City bombing. It's seven, almost 17 years after. If everybody's been brought to justice, why can't we see them? You know, Jesse Trinidad tries to get access to the tapes. Uh, their story keeps changing. They say, well, we can't find them. It's biggest manhunt in history, biggest investigation in history at that time. And and they can't find the tapes. That's ridiculous. Then they leak out some of them, and they all go blank at 9.02 a.m., and they say, well, they were all these different buildings with different security companies all changed their tapes at 9.02 a.m. It just gets ludicrous. We went back to the service, ADT Security Service. Their building, coincidentally left, was less than two blocks from the Murrah building. Went back to his, the supervisor, and he says, no, there was nothing wrong with those cameras. They had checked them less than two weeks before the bombing happened on routine maintenance. They're, they're basically the service reps. Went to the Murrah building and said, yeah, these cameras are working fine. No worries here. Pay your bill, and we're on our way. Well, that's like Princess Diana, where all the cameras turn off right as it happens. And then the, her own letter comes out and the video, but the government seized it, where she said, Prince Charles says he's going to kill me in a fake auto accident. And then we're the conspiracy theorist for not buying the official story of Diana. When she said, Charles is going to kill me, and how he said he was going to do it. Yeah, I mean, it's a pattern that we see time and time again, you know, they won't, they never want to let the tapes out. And, you know, I think the final uh, court decision, there was the CIA came forward and said that uh, it would pose a grave risk to national security if these tapes were to be released. You know, we're supposed to forget that John Doe number two ever existed, you know, is the greatest manhunt in history. That's and right, the government just, said <laughs> national security. Just like when the Sinaloa cartel said, we ship drugs in for America, you ship us guns. The government came in and said, it's true, national security. One Another uh, very peculiar aspect on this, the research was, there are agencies, Alex, that we never knew even existed out of Washington and Langley, Virginia, that are popping up on the, the FOIA request, that we know that they showed up at the crime scene that morning. And it's like, wow, uh, where did this agency come from? Where did these people come from? If it was a lone nut driving a, an ANFO-laden truck bomb in front of a building, why do you have some of the top 14 agencies, some of them that we never knew existed, show up in Oklahoma City? Why was the head happen? of the uh, FBI anti-terrorism group lying, that saying he wasn't there, and it turns out he was? It's, it's amazing. Lies after lies after lies. So this, this film, we know that we really are clarifying a lot of those concerns of bringing out information nobody's ever seen before. And like you were saying earlier, you got Mark Penn, who uh, is head of a uh, PR firm that specializes in public relations for, uh, you know, genocidal uh, third world dictators, saying that the only thing that's going to save the Obama administration is another Oklahoma City bombing. You know, I mean, they're they're ramping up for it, and I think we're overdue for another false flag. And so getting the word out, you know, going to the Infowars store, buying the DVD, spreading this information, this this could actually save lives, I think. And I mean, I, and I know you guys seen... spent, what, I mean, three or four years getting this done. Yeah, I mean, it was, uh, you know, years of research, almost, seven, you know, 16 years of research that we incorporated into the movie. But, yes, it was uh, over a year and a half in production because we wanted to have that. Yeah, because I remember Chris talking to me about this value. like two years ago. All right, guys, it's available at Infowars.com, A Noble Lie, Oklahoma City, 95. Everybody get it. And let's go ahead and get you guys set up for next week. We need to talk about some of the other witnesses you want to bring in for next week's interview. Amazing. Bob Chapman straight ahead. A ton of news. Stay with us.